I'm really happy to be joined this evening by Carol Siegel, the director of the Freud Museum, and also by Patricia Townsend, who is one of the judges um, what, uh, assessing the entries to choose which work we would, which work we'd finally commission. Um, Patricia is an artist and also a psychoanalytic psychotherapist and a writer about psychoanalysis and the creative process. Last year, she published a very interesting book um, called uh, Creative States of Mind, Psychoanalysis and the Artist's Process, which I recommend highly to you all. Um, and she also has interviewed the artists who produce works for our exhibition. And you can listen to those interviews, extracts of those interviews on our website in podcast form, if you're interested to do that. Um, so, um, I, before going any further, I'd like to uh, hand over to Carol um, to say a few words as director of the Freud Museum. Hello, and uh, yes, it's, it's lovely to be here at this virtual private view. Um, as Liz says, um, this, the exhibition was postponed from its original uh, incarnation, which was meant to be earlier in the spring. And it's uh, been a pleasure working with the UCL Psychoanalysis Unit. Again, as Liz says, this is the third time that we've worked together um, to produce, um, well, with the, with the help of all the contributing artists, um, some really, uh, you know, lovely, lovely works, lovely exhibitions, and this one is no exception. Um, it does seem strange to be welcoming you, though, not physically at the moment, but the exhibition is physically in the Freud Museum, and just to remind people, if they're not aware, that the museum is open to the public. Um, so we're open Wednesday, Saturday and Sunday. So it is possible to go and see these works. So again, you know, thank you to the artists and thank you to the organisers. Uh, the museum is very happy to be, be again working on this. Um, unfortunately, melancholia seems a particularly appropriate subject this year but it certainly produced um, a, a, a really fascinating uh, exhibition with the works spread throughout the house and yeah I hope that you all get an opportunity to see it and to, to appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much Carol. Um, I'll just say a little bit about you know what's going to happen next. So we've made a, a film um, sort of walking you through the exhibition to allow you to get a glimpse of the works in situ. And a really special aspect of these exhibitions is the context in which we embed them, um, which we've tried to convey a bit of in the film. But I really do encourage you, as Carol says, to go along to the museum, spend some time there, enjoy the atmosphere. It's such a unique and special place. Um, and it, these works really will repay longer study than you'll have the opportunity to give to them in our very short film. So we'll show the film and then um, Patricia is going to talk a little bit about the experience of participating in the selection process and how that relates to her own work. Um, and then she's going to have a bit of dialogue with the artists. Let's see if we can, uh, if we can get the film playing. In March 2020, UCL's Psychoanalysis Unit, in collaboration with the Freud Museum, was due to mount an exhibition of artworks produced by students from the Slade School of Fine Art and the University of the Arts London, exploring the theme of melancholia and its links with psychoanalysis and creativity. But before the exhibition could take place, the coronavirus pandemic closed the doors of the Freud Museum and forced us to place the exhibits in storage. Six months later, in what may prove to be only a fleeting respite, the exhibition has finally been mounted. Come into the museum with us for a glimpse. Freud's last home is his memorial and a monument to his passion for the past. He was an avid collector of antiquities he claimed to have read more archaeology than psychology, and the treasures that crowd his study inspired and informed his vision of the psyche. Among these relics, if you turn your back on the icons that crowd the area of Freud's study where the couch is placed, you will see Ruby Rose's collection of 64 broken nails, 
displayed in the type of case normally used to display insects. The broken nails speak to Freud's characterization of melancholia as a special type of mourning for a relationship that has been damaged or broken. On a table opposite the door of the study, plugs of zinc are suspended on copper wires in a glass tank containing a lead acetate solution. Lead crystals imperceptibly grow and proliferate, gradually taking over the tank as time passes. In a meditation on the experience of time in melancholia that the artist Cherry Song has titled Absence of Mind. Melancholia is not always a steady state. Sometimes it involves emotional peaks as well as troughs. On the first floor landing, Holly Hewitt's sculpture, Loss of Innocence, is composed of a series of repeating brass shapes, informed by data collected from a run along the Yorkshire Three Peak Challenge route. The three peaks symbolise her journey from self-hatred and despondency through expressive anger to acceptance and hope. In the upstairs room dedicated to the memory of Anna Freud, Anna Stroh has created two contrasting images that evoke the melancholia involved in the process of gender performance, the digital 3D image representing the external self, while the mixed media drawing reflects the internal self. On the half landing are two final works. Molly McFadden's paintings depict the two windsocks at either end of the foil bridge in Derry, one on the Catholic West Bank and the other on the Protestant East, passive and silent sentinels marking a spot where multiple suicides have taken place. Kaja Garapich's work, Black Sun, comprises a convex mirror in a golden frame, paired with a black circle whose reflection cannot be evaded when the visitor contemplates their own reflection. Everyone who looks in the mirror is drawn into the black sun of melancholia. Freud wrote that when a bond of love is shattered, the shadow of the object falls upon the ego. But later, he recognised that these shattering experiences also help us to grow. Art may have an extremely important role to play, not simply in holding up a mirror to reflect our experiences in dark times, nor in comforting us by picturing an alternate reality, but in helping us to work through the pain we feel when the world as we knew it seems to have come to an end. I'm really happy to have been involved in this project and I think the, ex the work in the exhibition, I think you'll agree, is really exciting. Um, I really was asked to, to be in it because I've written this book, as Liz was saying, I've got it, it's, it's Creative States of Mind. And, um, and I was asked this evening to say a bit about the book, uh, but I didn't want to do that without bringing in the artists um, who have, have taken part in this exhibition. So I'll do that in a minute, but I'll just say a few words first about how I came to write the book. Um, I've had a double career as both an artist and a psychoanalytic psychotherapist. And as an artist, I had become increasingly interested in the states of mind that I experience as I'm making a new work of art. So, for instance, I began to wonder about how my ideas arose. Sometimes they felt as though they came from nowhere, although I realised that obviously that couldn't be the case. Something must be going on outside my awareness before the idea popped into my head. And I also wondered why I often felt so elated when I had a new idea, even though I knew from experience that it would probably only be a day or two or maybe even less before I realised that actually this wasn't such a great idea after all. And I also wondered about what was going on out of my awareness when I was actually making the work, when I got into a particular state of mind as I worked with my medium. So as a, as a psychotherapist, my first thought was to turn to psychoanalysis to see if I could find some answers to those questions. And what I found was that um, there isn't a lot of psychoanalytic writing about the process of making art. There's a lot about artists and artists motivation. There's a lot about works of art, but there's not very much about the artist process. 
Um, and what there is, is often written by psychoanalysts who have artists in analysis with them, not surprisingly. And sometimes those artists are in analysis partly because they're stuck with their work, something's blocking them. And the work they hope that by getting some help that that will change that situation. But I wondered, well, what about the, those artists who haven't got a block? What about the normal process of making art? What can psychoanalysis say about that? And also I found that there wasn't an account of the whole journey of making a new piece of art from the first moment when the artist has an inkling that they want to make something until the point where the, the finished work goes out to a commissioner or into an exhibition. So that's why I wanted to write a book, to try to fill in those gaps. And I wanted to, this book to be rooted in artists' own experiences. So I didn't want to start from theory. I wanted to start from what artists themselves said about the states of mind they experience. So obviously to do that, I needed to interview some artists and not just go by my own experience. So I interviewed over 30 professional artists and ask them about the states of mind they experience at each stage of the process of making a new work. And those interviews are the basis, the sort of backbone in a way of my book. And I've also drawn on the writing of um, a number of psychoanalysts who, who I found very helpful, such as Donna Winnicott, Marion Milner, Christopher Bolas, um, those are the main people, but also a number of others, to try to build a picture of what's going on, but not only of what the artists are aware of, but also what they're not aware of. So, as I said, I wanted to actually sort of bring in the artists and get them to help me to think about this tonight. Um, as, as Liz said, I've interviewed each of the artists about why they wanted to apply for the commission on melancholia and their process of making the work that's in, now in the show. And luckily I managed to get those interviews in, um, in person before lockdown happened. So that was just in time, I think. Uh, what I found was that many of the experiences and feelings that these artists described were similar to the experiences of the artists that I'd interviewed for the book, but there were also some individual differences. And I want to give a few examples and get the artist to help me with that. So in the book, I write about how a new artwork begins. And what I found from my interviews was that for many of them, it, it, in a way, you, it's difficult to pin down when something begins because it arises out of your whole life. But there's a trigger often when the artist comes across something in the outside world that really grabs them, that feels significant. So it might be an art, a landscape, it could be a political issue, it could be a person, it could be a piece of music, it could be anything. But whatever it is triggers a feeling that this is personally significant to them and that the artist wants to make an artwork and can make an artwork that's related to that outside something. And I've called this feeling the artist's pre-sense. It isn't necessarily a specific idea for what form the eventual artwork might take because that usually comes a bit later on. So uh, I just want to think about how if at all, that relates to what these artists in this exhibition have told me. And for some of them, by the time they saw the call for proposals, they already had a pre-sense for a new work or even a specific idea. And I'd like to bring in Molly McFadden now, who's, who's um, made these wonderful paintings, those stone-faced dolmens. And Molly, I wonder if you could say a bit about how you got the idea for making this work and how that actually started before you saw the call for proposals? Uh, so my work tends to look at kind of social issues in Northern Ireland where I'm from. Um, I tend to use like object, objects and spaces in the sense of objectivity to discuss like points of kind of neutrality uh, in the kind of Northern experience. Um, especially because like a lot of the imagery and even like objects and spaces where I'm from are highly politicized and um, my work is kind of, I try to make it as like neutral as possible. I don't want it to be charged with any kind of agenda. Um, 
one of those issues is the suicide epidemic in the north uh and you know that was something that I knew I wanted to talk about in my work and I kind of sat with that for a couple of months before the language that I was going to use kind of presented itself to me um and that took the shape of like the, those two one socks that stand at the end of the foil bridge uh it was something about you know their inherent objectivity their like passive perspective to you know, political tensions and both the, the suicide epidemic itself and the kind of irony that they stand at either end of a bridge that kind of joins um, a nationalist area and a unionist area. Uh, so I, I just thought that was kind of a really apt um, metaphor for the kind of issue I was trying to describe. Mm, great. No, thank you very much. That's really interesting. Thanks. Sure. Um, so for, for other artists, the call for proposals itself was a trigger that led them to think about an ongoing interest in a different way. And I, I'd like to bring Ruby in now. Ruby, who's done the, the installation, the 64 Broken Nails, um, which is also wonderful. Ruby, could you say a little bit about how it happened for you, how the, the call, the, the call for proposals changed how you were thinking about your collection of nails yeah um hi patricia hi everyone um i think personally for me like commissions are a really exciting opportunity to be presented with like a new framework through which to think around your own practice or things that you're doing but within a new context and so I often do collect things or keep things and sometimes these become parts of work but i don't always quite know how how they're going to manifest. Um, so I hadn't really thought before about the kind of inherent melancholia within the act of like trying to preserve things and the kind of impossibility of preserving anything for a particularly long time. Um, and so it led me to sort of think about what we decide to preserve and what are the sort of structures in place that decide what we try to keep and what we don't deem worthy of keeping. Um, so these were sort of like new paths of thought that the um, and new context that the commission sort of enabled me to think about in relation to the work. Thank you. That's great. I think it's worked out really brilliantly, hasn't it? I think it looks great in the exhibition. Thank you. Um, so just carrying on after the artist has a pre sense, there's often a lot of hard work in the form of research and experimentation before he or she has an idea about what form the work might take. And then comes the making stage and the artist enters into a sort of dialogue with the developing work, almost as if the work is beginning to have a life of its own. And I'd like to bring Anna in here because Anna, you've made this double portrait talking to myself, which seems to really um, be relevant to what I'm saying here. And I wonder if you could say something about the conversation that you had with the work, if I can call it that. Yeah, so um, in my practice, I'm interested in this idea of self and the pluralities that exist within that self and within a singular body. So in this piece, um, I was working on two self portraits that I then imagined as this kind of dialogue between my internal self and external self. But um, an additional aspect that then came in when I was working on it was that it wasn't just that imagined dialogue, but also my dialogue with the work itself. Um, and I think that because um, the self and identity is something that is constantly in flux, when you're then working on a represent representation of yourself, that becomes a dialogue where, um, the manifestation is forcing me to reflect on my own identity and how it's changing as I'm working on the piece. And simultaneously, the work kind of evolves to become this separate entity that has its own identity that pieces of myself are then reflected onto. Great. Yes, that's, that's really interesting. Thank you. Um, so in, in the interviews for the book, artists 
often talked about being in a very absorbed state of mind as they were working. And this tended for most of them to be a pleasurable sort of absorption and a different state of mind from that of everyday life. And the person I'd like to bring in here is, is Holly, because Holly, um, you, you spent hours making the brass pieces for your work, Loss of Innocence. And I know um, that you got into a particular state of mind as you were doing that. I wonder if you could talk a bit about that, please. Sure. Hi, Patricia. Hi. Hi, thanks. Yeah, um, so there was 39 pieces that were the same. So it was a, a very process heavy sculpture. Um, and once I'd kind of figured out how I was making it and the processes involved, it was very much like a kind of repetitive, almost a methodical kind of process. So for me, I just sort of put on a podcast or some music and go into almost like a trance. I'm not really thinking about what I'm doing. I'm just sort of repeating it and it was a lot of hours spent probably like an entire week or more um producing each piece so I was sawing it and and soldering it together and um I just I find it a really nice place to be it's sort of my mind can kind of wander and either listen to a podcast or just sort of think and um I find it quite therapeutic yeah, that's that's really great, actually, because bringing in the idea of something that's therapeutic, that the, the actual process of making is is helping you is is very interesting. Thanks. That's great. Um, so I want to just go on to think about the fact that the making stage can be quite it can be quite a playful time and a trying out of different things, but it can also be an anxious one for some artists and particularly if the work's very experimental. And also, I think, particularly if the artist is not so experienced. So this was one difference I noticed between the interviews that I did for the book, which were all with, with very experienced artists and the interviews I did for this project um, that I think there was that there was I heard more about anxiety from these artists than I did when I was when I was um, interviewing for the book but I think if you're doing something really experimental something you haven't done before there's the worry about is it going to work can I do this and so on and I'd like to bring Cherry in here um, Cherry your work absence of mind is really ambitious and very experimental um, and and I, I wonder if you could say something about how you felt about that as you were making it. So I remember when we were talking, you were talking about it actually being quite, quite fearful at times. You were working with a really dangerous substance. Could you say a bit about that? Um, yeah, I had no idea if it was going to work. I sort of just winged it. And I guess that sort of connects to the idea of melancholia. It's sort of super chaotic you have no idea what's going on you're sort of just like going with it but I'm trying to do it from a playful and like more positive perspective I guess and the sort of anxiety that comes with not knowing I think that kind of deepens the complexity of um, the purely depressive factors of melancholia as a theme and idea. Great, thank you very much. And um, well done actually getting it there in the museum and it's actually working now, so that's terrific. <laughs> Great, well done. Um, so one, one thing that I really noticed as I was talking to the artists that I think was true for all of them actually, was that the excitement and pleasure that they gained from making the work for the, for the commission, that it's, it was a really um, good experience for all of them, I think. And I thought that was quite remarkable, considering that the subject was melancholia and they were finding a form for some very difficult experiences and emotions. And for some of the artists, the form of the final work reflected both the pleasure and the emotions of melancholia. And I'd like to bring Kasia in here, please. Um, Kasia, could you say something about the way in which your work, Black Sun, combines both those different aspects? I think it's very clear in your work. Um, hi, so um, um, I just think because you know, like if you allow me to start sort of from the beginning, going back to your first question, which was uh, about the open call and the idea. So what happened to me, I had no idea what I'm going to do. I just went to see the Freud's museum. I have been to Freud's museum before, but um, 
I knew I'm looking for something I haven't seen uh, on my previous visit. And uh, it happened when I was walking around the museum that actually it was not something I was uh, looking for in particular, but something which I noticed was not there. <laughs> so my, uh, my impression was that the only mirror in the museum is the one on the landing. So I did really go, went back you know, to research that why, and you know, I've noticed few other mirrors which were the ones from the collection of Egyptian mirrors they in the main uh, study, but also there is a, a the photograph from the from the Freud study from his Viennese apartment where there is a mirror strangely hung on the on the window, um, and you know that sort of triggered my. Uh, uh, my thought process and um, and meanwhile I went back to read Kristeva Black Sun which I have read before but because it was one of the one of the books sort of recommended to look at uh, for the for the open call I just went back to it and you know I started to think about how uh, one can actually uh, show or represent something so abstract as uh, Belanholia, but in these very specific words of Kristeva, Black Sun, how, how that can be shown. And that led me to actually think about, you know, the, uh, that the, the, the open call and the commission was actually site specific uh, work, working with the substance of the, of the house and the museum. Uh, so, you know, that sort of led me through and um, it got me to the concept first and then the final idea and the placement of the work was related to my first visit, I guess, because, you know, it's uh, the black sun is exactly where the mirror is in a collection um, on the landing. And I think, um, you know, it made me and then we coming to the final part which is the pleasure when you see the work actually being there and uh working the way you want it to work <laughs> yes yes and and actually you're the mirror with this gold rim as you said in the you know, it's a bit like the sun in a way it reminds you of the sun there's something quite um, opposite to that from to the black um, to the black circle on the other side of the room, isn't there? They're, they're sort of working together in coming from opposite directions. Yes, and what was important for me as well was to, um, that the work would draw anyone, even involuntarily, everyone who visits the museum passes through the landing, they will be uh, drawn into the black sun. Mm. Even if they don't notice it, they will be always there. So kind of, I don't know, for me, it kind of sum up the way I think about it. Great, thank you very much. Thank That's you. really interesting. And that was it's very successful as well. I think they all are. So, I mean, just listening to all the artists makes me think about the amazing variety of artists' experiences. I mean, when I was writing the book, I was really trying to pull things together and bring out common ground and the shared aspect of the process of making art. But of course, every artist is different. I mean, just listening to the six artists tonight, we can easily see that and every uh, and every process is different as well and in a way that's what's so wonderful about it so anyway I just want to congratulate all the artists because I think it's a great show I think you've all done brilliantly and I know how much thought and effort you've all put into it and it's it, I think it's great that you've taken the theme of melancholia and created something that's really living and vibrant with it so well done everybody thank you Thanks very much, Patricia. Um, it was really interesting to hear um, what you were saying about the artist's process. And I was thinking as you were talking that when thinking about melancholia, we're also thinking about a psychic process, aren't we? And, and the, um, the, sort of the complexity of, of that process. So, so um, at the time that Freud was writing this paper, he was also thinking, starting to develop his ideas about repetition and compulsion. But he was also thinking about play. So there's, you know, there's that kind of ambiguity of, in repetitive processes, whether they're, um, you know, constraining or creative. And I think some of the works in this exhibition bring that out really in a really interesting way.